Now, we're going to talk over these next days to come, this 12-day summit, with a number of Canadian voices. But our first this morning, I'm really looking forward to hearing, Kehekesha Basu was one of the two representatives at a youth summit ahead of COP back in Milan this September. We're going to talk about that. But she will be in Glasgow on Thursday of this week as a representative to uh, COP26. And she is with me this morning. And it is a pleasure to say hello, good morning, and welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Listen, since the, our, our, my plan has been upended by the Prime Minister's arrival, so let's show some pictures of Justin Trudeau arriving and greeting people and uh, walking in. And I'm going to begin by, as you watch this closely, uh, Keheka Shah, what are your expectations and what are your hopes for the role Canada plays and Justin Trudeau plays at this summit? I think that Canada has the potential to just expand on the leadership role it has taken in ensuring uh, climate action and uh, moreover climate justice for all. And I think that Canada has a huge opportunity here to advocate for localization and uh, like recognizing the unique challenges that climate change uh, poses to different regions of the world and in different communities and large nations such as ours so really ensuring that we have those unique solutions that allows uh, us to act upon the unique challenges in those localized contexts. There has been an indication from the Prime Minister that Canada will be announcing some new commitments. Is there anything in particular, a number or a specific promise that you'll be keeping your ear to? Well, I really hope that uh, Canada talks about how uh, climate change is impacting uh, us, not just from the planetary lens, but from the human lens as well. And it should really be about ensuring climate justice and recognizing the intersections that climate change has with our other world's challenges and most of all, like inequalities and how it exacerbates inequality. So really looking at it from that human uh, perspective that uh, recognizes how climate change is an inequality multiplier. Which is one of the big... Uh priorities for you, I know, it will be as you head over there, and I want to talk about that as well. But since the leaders are arriving, and we'll go back and show some more live shots, as, as I said, some 120 leaders arrived today with some 200 nations representative. But with these leaders arriving, I'm wondering when you see these live shots, these are the leaders that are going to be making the big speeches and the sweeping promises. What do you think? Is there any cynicism at all, or are you fully optimistic about what may be accomplished over the summit? do you think? Well, my perspective is that of an optimist, because I think if we lose the hope, then, you know, there's kind of really no point to doing this. I am really optimistic that uh, we will be able to move forward. And I think the pandemic has really woken us up to how important urgent action is. So it is really my hope that there are policies and agreements made that really benefit everyone. But honestly, I am more concerned about how those are implemented after COP26, because this is going to be my fourth uh, co conference of the parties with climate change. And there's usually a void that happens after the climate change conferences. So it's really my hope that world leaders are able to go back to their nations and implement what was discussed uh, in their national context and then adopt a culture of multilateralism to really help each other ensure climate justice on a global scale. Okay, so I think we got a bit of your wish list. When you're in attendance, these are the things I, well, as you outline your priorities when you arrive on Thursday, what will you be specifically advocating for and what will uh, you be wanting to be hearing from them? Well, as a grassroots advocate, I would be bringing the voices of those who work on the ground, who have the lived experiences of climate change. And really, I'd be advocating for ensuring that those lived experiences are taken into account uh, by world leaders when they're discussing your policy so that we're really able to reach out to the farthest first and really ensure that no one is left behind. And uh, most importantly, I will be speaking about how important education is in this context and how how important feminist climate justice is so that we are able to ensure that women and girls are not left behind when we're talking about addressing climate change. So that's, you know, you're talking about transformative social and economic measures. 
um, and remaining optimistic about them. Although, I'm wondering, you know, even out of the G20, there was not as much substantive action taken as was pledged, and there was disappointment expressed by by many, actually, of the participants. And I'm wondering if you think it really is, you know, sort of fixable at this at this summit. I think it is definitely fixable. I think that, you know, we must not give up that hope. And if we see a setback, it's just the onus is really upon us to work even harder to ensure that we're able to move forward. And I think that there is definitely a hope for us to achieve that progress with those concerted actions. And yes, there weren't many uh, really binding uh, agreements made. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's definitely need for that right now. But I think that there is definitely hope for a better future if we start uh, acting more now. Okay. And, and again, just coming back to the point you made, the pandemic has shown what it's like to face a global crisis. But in many ways, the pandemic has shown that we failed as a world to respond to collectively with equal access to care and to treatment and to vaccines and all of those things. So I'm wondering if maybe, you know, there are some people who have expressed the fact that there is a lot of nationalism now, that the collective will to reach solutions, as we saw during the pandemic, may not be there to the degree that is necessary. Yes, absolutely. But I still think that you know, there were instances of uh, multilateralism and there were instances of uh, world leaders taking uh, urgent action. So I think that, you know, it's we can definitely look at uh, what the pandemic has taught us and really act upon those best practices and ensure that we really don't make the same mistakes of the past and really uh, not just build back better, but build forward equal towards a new normal. And that definitely includes addressing climate change and ensuring climate justice for all. So I would like to say that we'd like to hook up, with, visit with you again once you're over there and get in the midst of things uh, later in the week. But for us right now as we start, as you begin, as this begins, what does success look like here? I would say that success is all about having policies that really take into account the lived experiences of those affected most by climate change and that those policies are actually implemented on the ground uh, and really just benefits uh, everyone. So I think that more than just COP26, we have to keep uh, talking about what is beyond COP26. And I think that would be my ultimate uh, vision of success where everything discussed at COP26 is implemented actually on the ground and the voices of those most loved behind are taken into account while instituting those policies. Fantastic. Thank you so much for setting this up. And I am looking forward to a future conversation with you. Thank you for the time and, again, for your expertise and insight. Thanks. Thank you.